First of all, what Christians mean when they talk about love your enemies is the subject of endless discussion and debate among Christians. And second of all, a lot of what Christians tend to say they mean when they talk about love of enemies is amply, abundantly attested in rabbinic literature as well. I mean, one yeah, so for whatever it's worth, I would argue that my, you know, pursuit of the heart of the Jewish tradition, you know, the title of my previous book, The Heart of Torah, the subtitle of this one, Recovering the Heart of Jewish Life, that that's a very traditional undertaking. Jews have always done that. You know, if you want to sort of help people orient, you have to give them some center around which to think about their spiritual lives, their lives in learning, their lives in, in mitzvah observance. I think there's something actually deeply traditional about that. That's what I meant when I said, Rabbi Akiva sets the precedent when he says, love your neighbor as yourself is a great principle of Torah. The example that you cite from Tractate Makot is another great example of that. There's a kind of unapologetic willingness to distill, right? The notion that you can simply override the grain of nature is a fantasy and often leads to morally undesirable positions. I mean, one of the things that I try to argue in this book in a relatively quiet way is that you know, the, the philosopher Bernard Williams famously argued, look, if you're going to ask me to justify why I save my wife versus someone else, I'm not, I don't find that question interesting. And while I'm sympathetic to that, what I disagree with Williams about is that he's basically saying, at that point, I'm not interested in morality. And I'm interested in arguing, actually, even from a moral perspective, you would save your wife first because that's what it means to be a human being. To be a human being is to have relationships. When you ask human beings to completely strip away any relationships or commitments that they have and then make moral decisions, you say to them, strip away your humanity and then make moral decisions from there. That doesn't make any sense to me. Rabbi Shai Held is one of the most important and influential rabbis in America. Uh, he holds a doctorate in religion from Harvard University. He's the founder of the Hadar Institute, which is uh, an institute I've gained and learned a tremendous amount from. I've, I've attended some Hadar events over the years and I've enjoyed them immensely. He's the author of numerous books. And for me personally, he's someone who I would consider one of my teachers um, of, of Torah and, and Judaism. So I'm incredibly grateful, uh, Rabbi Held, uh, that you have joined me today to talk about your new book, Judaism is About Love. Um, Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Um, yeah, I'll just sort of reiterate or, or expand a little bit. You know, um, I studied for yeshiva in Israel, um, yeshiva Hartzion for two years. And uh, I was, you know, very from back in those days, so to speak, very, you know, orthodox and and, and rigid. And I went through uh, college experiences and, and I, I became somewhat disillusioned with the orthodoxy that I had learned and been practicing. And your Torah was, you know, one of the people that really um, helped me find a, a kind of formulation of, of Judaism, which, which felt much, um, which resonated deeply with me and helped me find my path. Um, and so that was going back like almost, I don't know, 15 years ago at this point when, when that sort of story played out. But um, there's, there's sort of that gratitude there uh, from, from my side of the screen. So uh, really, yeah, really a pleasure. Thank you for sharing that. That's very moving. Thank you. My first question for you. Um, you wrote this wonderful book. How does Judaism, Judaism is about love. And, and I know I've been following, you've been promoting it or not promoting, we're talking about this book, let's say teaching this book to audiences um, in all different venues and contexts. How, how has that experience been? And how does it compare to the experience of working on a book like this? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. You know, I will say that I have been very moved and in some ways surprised, and I'll get to that in a minute, but very, very moved by the kind of dramatic degree of open-heartedness I feel like I've been met with as I've been traveling around the country talking about this book. I'm, I say I'm surprised by it because I really didn't know what to expect in the wake of October 7th and the trauma that many Jews had been experiencing. Um, and I have just found that people have come to events and have written me letters and have responded to podcasts by really wanting to talk about real things, wanting to talk about why am I here? Why are we the Jewish people here? What is this about? What is this for? It's just been very, I mean, raw is another word I would use and very, very moving. 
So that's been really great. I mean, I will say another piece that, you know, you can tell me whether this is kind of fits with your interest in this particular conversation is I've been really struck by the reception that sort of the book and some of what I've been saying has received among at least certain segments of the Christian population. You know, I've been appearing on a lot of Christian podcasts, have visited a bunch of Christian seminaries and Catholic colleges. And there's a real desire, I find. Now, obviously, this is a self-selecting crowd, right? These are the people who are choosing to engage with me. But there are a lot of people out there who understand that the way Christians have traditionally been taught to think and talk about Judaism, that those ways are obsolete at best and offensive at worst. And they're looking for something else, and they don't really know what that something else ought to be. And mm -hmm. there's been remarkable, I would say, I've been met with real hunger in that way. And that's been kind of very touching, humbling, a little overwhelming at times even. Yeah. The the landscape of the Jewish world is is very diverse. And I think what's beautiful about the work you do and, and, the, and the writing you do is the way in which you pull from what seems to me, from my perspective, to be such a, a, a diverse range of the spectrum of Jewish thought and, and Jewish writing. Can you maybe speak to that a little bit? How, how you sort of view that broad landscape of what Judaism means for different people and how it's practiced? Yeah, you know, so let me maybe back into an answer to that. I never set out, you know, I never sort of sat down one day and said, okay, one of the things I'm going to do is model drawing on an incredibly eclectic array of sources. That was not a conscious process. It was sort of more, you know, I was raised in a kind of cognitive dissonance experiment, right? In yeshiva day school with relatively secular Jewish academic parents, conservative day camp, um, academic Jewish studies, yeshivas in Israel, JTS, like I, I sort of have been in a lot of Jewish worlds, have always been drawn to Haredi Svarim, to ultra-Orthodox learning, you know, and so kind of very organically, as I've gotten older and I've started to sort of research kind of bigger questions in Jewish thought, I just end up in a lot of different places and sort of synthesizing between them or bringing conversation between them just feels like the most natural thing in the world to me. I mean, it's almost a little bit of a cliche, but, you know, Rambam's, Maimonides' famous formulation about being willing to learn the truth from whoever says it is a little bit of a lodestar for me and, and you know, very, very important. So I'm happy to write in a way that I'm quoting a Protestant Bible scholar one day and the Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir on the next day and have them talk to each other. That feels like the most natural thing in the world to me. I do understand that it's not so common. People don't have the language skills, language literally as in languages, but language also in terms of like how to live inside these different bodies of literature. So I get that it's not so common, but it doesn't feel like a concerted effort on my part, if that makes sense. It just sort of feels like the natural outgrowth um, of where I've been. And I, I think that it's important to me to say also if there's an argument that I'm making in doing that, it's a relatively quiet and understated one, which is that in general, there are things we can learn even from people we imagine we have nothing to learn from. I really like putting 20th century Haredi sources in front of reformed Jews. It's very important to me. I like doing the reverse, although I don't have that many Haredi students. I have some who write to me, but I don't have them often in a room, right? But I, so it, it's, it's very important to me that people be exposed to wisdom and insight from places where they might think, places that at best they think are kind of hermetically sealed off from them. And at worst, oh, those folks and I have nothing in common. And, you know, I, I would love to sort of help people explode those kinds of misconceptions. So that work of drawing from the different, the different, uh, ideas and, and philosophies. Is there um, is there is there any pushback? Do, do, do you feel internally or externally? Because I think among human beings and among religions and in Judaism, there's a lot of judgment. And maybe and maybe part of what's being modeled here is uh, a different way of of thinking about of that different hashka, hashkafot philosophies, uh, which is maybe less judgmental. Is that does that resonate or? Yeah, I think that's true. I, 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 you know, I think that I've always had some people who pick up 
things that I write and are like, what is this guy doing? Right. Like, I don't, I don't understand the genre of this exactly. Is this is this a Dvar Torah? Is this an essay in biblical scholarship? Is this the what is this exactly? And I guess I, I, I mean, I don't mean this to sound coy that those questions don't really resonate with me so much. Meaning as part of it's another way of saying the same thing, like the genre of my writing is like a less interesting question to me than, oh, am I saying things that Jews in particular, human beings in general can engage with, learn from, criticize, all that is fine. You, you know, so yeah, I do get that response sometimes, but you know, it goes back to something I said a minute ago about Christians. It's a very self-selecting crowd. Look, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox Jews who write to me that they're reading my book of essays on the Torah, you know, my last book, The Heart of Torah. So they're obviously a self-selecting crowd. They want something different than what they're used to. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story that you'll appreciate given your background, which is kind of a funny thing to share on a, you know, in a in a YouTube discussion, but but whatever. Um I had a man come up to me years ago at a conference totally unrelated to anything explicitly Torah related. He comes up to me, Haredi man, or I would you know, Brooklyn centrist Orthodox. So on the border of modern Orthodox and Haredi, he says, Rabbi, come here a minute. I'm like, okay, this is going to be great. He says, I want to tell you something. My friends and I, we read the heart of Torah every Shabbos. We just don't tell anyone. Right. And I just said, you know what? You just made my day. I love this so much. Yeah. Jews are very complicated. Human yeah. beings are very complicated. I, I mean, it's fine. I'm I'm happy to be, you know, in a role like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is it funny that sometimes people quote me and do it without attribution because they're nervous about quoting me? Sure. But you know, honestly, I've gotten to the point where I try to see that as a kind of spiritual practice of a it's a way of being reminded that you don't own the Torah you teach, that you're channeling something that doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there are people who quote me without attribution. That should be the biggest problem I have in this lifetime. <laughs> okay. Let's let's talk about the book. Um, Judaism is about love. I've heard you say that the title is a provocation. Um, is that fair? What is what does that mean? What what was the what went into this uh title and, and what do you want people to to sort of see in the title? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I mean, I've been using that that phrase lately because I have found it helpful for clarifying because sometimes I, I, I've been meeting people who say things to me like, well, Judaism can't be about one thing. I mean, after all, it's a vast and variegated ocean. It's about a lot of things. To which my traditional yeshivish response is, in hachinami, right? of course that's true. Judaism is, of course, about a lot of things. But my point is that for so long we have been told, and some of us have even internalized and perpetuated the notion that one of the things it is about is not love, or love is not one of the things it's about, that I'm trying to make a provocation and say one of the central things that Judaism is about is love. And even if you want to, you can plausibly read the whole tradition as a working out of the implications of living a life oriented around love. And I take some precedence there, obviously, in the famous statement in the in the um, Talmudic tradition of Rabbi Akiva saying that love your neighbor as yourself is the great principle of the Torah. What does it mean to say that? Um, I don't mean that Judaism is not about justice, that it is not about law, that it is not about other things too. Although again, in each one of those instances, I would say each one of those things is not a contrast to love, but something to be interestingly threaded with it. So that's a, a kind of important piece. I'll also mention that my colleague, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, recently said something to me that I found enormously helpful. It is a, for those of, you know, any of your listeners who have studied with Ethan, this is like a classic Ethan Tucker distinction. He said, you know, people are misunderstanding the title. They think that the title is Judaism is about love, but the title is actually Judaism is about love. So let's walk through that distinction. Yeah, I think what he's saying is, you know, people are saying Judaism is about love. Uh, what do you mean? Judaism is about justice. Judaism right. is about law. Ju but it's, that's not what you're I, saying. You're saying Judaism really is about right. love. Don't tell me right. that that's not one of the it, core things it's, it's about. Part of the set. It, yeah. And and I think right. that's a really, ins it's actually more insight into my title than I had when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I wrote it on the assumption that, you know, so first of all, it, it's worth saying, I mean, in the world of publishing, they don't usually allow you to have a title that is a declarative sentence, mm -hmm. right? That is kind of very rare. And when I floated that title to my editor, I was shocked when he said, oh, that's a surprising sentence. We should go with that. 
And I was like, right. And the fact that it's a surprising sentence is exactly why I've spent years of my life working on this, because there should be nothing surprising. I would love to get to a point, I dream of getting to a point where people say Judaism is about love. Well, duh, of course, Judaism is about love. What else would it be about? Right. But but obviously there's there's a kind of an uphill climb there. And that's the provocation. Yeah. So there's some of the finer points are, though, what how do, how do we define love and how do we act in a loving way and, and sort of what does it mean? Maybe we could start. I mean, Christianity is, is generally associated with the word love. Um, and in addition to the book exploring that, uh, your, your conversations, I think, have also probably to some extent explored that. So how do you think about the difference between uh, love in, in the Jewish tradition and love in the Christian tradition? Right. So that is, I think, a really, really important question. You know, it, it, it occurred to me only late in writing this book that I needed to take a step back and emphasize even more dramatically than I had that in saying that Judaism is about love, I am not saying Judaism is just Christianity avant la lettre, right? Before there was Christianity, there was Judaism, which lo and behold is a form of Christianity. That wasn't my point at all. My, you know, my point is, yes, there is a lot of shared interest in love, which is perhaps not surprising given some of our shared background. And in a whole array of issues, some of the ways we think about love tend to be different. You know, so just to take a couple of examples, in some pieces of the Protestant tradition, love is contrasted with law, right? Law and gospel are a kind of dichotomy. You find versions of this certainly very strongly in Martin Luther. And I think, you know, and I, as I try to say in the book, for a certain kind of like rabbinic spirituality, for the spirituality of the sages of the Talmud, the notion that love and law are a contrast is simply incomprehensible, right? For them, law itself is a revelation of love. We say in the L Jewish liturgy, right? tanu, Torah mitzvot tanu. With vast love have you loved us, God? You taught us Torah and commandments. It's almost like, I think for the sages of the Talmud, God is like a parent who's about to let his kids out into the world and says, you know, before you go, I'd like to offer you some guidance as to how to flourish in this world. And a little bit, that's what law is. When, when the book of Deuteronomy repeatedly describes the law as litovlach, for your own flourishing, that doesn't mean for your own good, meaning unless you do this, I'll punish you. It means I want you to have a society that flourishes and is worthy of my blessing, right? So here's some, here's some law and guidance as to how to go about that. I'm using the word guidance because that's in some ways a better translation of the word Torah than law or nomos is, right? Torah is in hora'ah, teaching in, in, in Hebrew. So, so that's, you know, that's one that's really, really important. Now I'll add as a footnote, since I think some of, some of your um, viewers might find this interesting. Um, one of the most interesting critiques I've gotten of my book so far has been from some Christian scholars who have said, you know, you don't always realize it, but your default portrayal of Christianity is very Lutheran. Mm. And that, you know, one particular kind of very prominent and I think really interesting Catholic ethicist said to me, he's like, you know, when you distinguish sometimes between Judaism and Christianity, I find myself on the Judaism side. Mm. As a student of Aquinas and a Catholic, I'm on your side about law. We have a vast legal tradition that we take very seriously. So that's been really kind of interesting, which is why I framed it the way I did is about Judaism and certain strands of Protestantism. And then in a, in a really interesting way, another scholar said to me recently, as a Wesleyan, I feel you're too Lutheran mm. in your portrayal of Christianity. So that's been like, I've, you know, you, I, you know, you put something out into the world and ideally you learn a tremendous amount just from people's engaging with it. And that's been obviously an incredible privilege for me. Um, I have literally a notebook full of things I need to research in light of things people have said to me or written to me. Um, and that, that's been kind of you know, almost like wondrous to me. Um, another interesting example, and it's a little bit complex, is that, you know, people often say something like, well, Christianity teaches us to love our enemies, whereas Judaism teaches us and then something else. You can fill in the blank. Different people will say different things. Don't be naive. Defend yourself, whatever it might be. So I learned kind of a lot of different things in trying to think about the relationship with Judaism and Christianity on this question. But one of them at one poll was that anytime you make a kind of stark dichotomy like that, you're going to oversimplify. First of all, what Christians mean when they talk about love your enemies is the subject of endless discussion and debate among Christians. 
And second of all, a lot of what Christians tend to say they mean when they talk about love of enemies is amply, abundantly attested in rabbinic literature as well. I mean, one example that I give in the book that I've been enjoying talking about, because I think people can hear this and it's not as threatening, you know, in, in the context of all the anxieties of our post-October 7th world, um, even though it could be heard that way, which is not how I mean it, is that the ethos of non-retaliation for interpersonal hurts, which I think is so central to Christian visions of love your enemies. I mean, Jews who recite traditional prayers three times a day pray for the ability to embrace an ethos of non-retaliation. We say, and to those who curse me, may my soul remain silent, right? And the rabbis valorize, they celebrate those who are able to be insulted and don't feel the need to insult in return. So I think there's like a lot of interesting things to say about the ways that there is some overlap. And yet that said, when Christian ethicists, as many do say, oh, love your enemies is the very heart of Jesus's teaching. I don't think any rabbinic sage would say love your enemies is the very heart of Jewish ethics. There's far more ambivalence and complexity around this question in the Jewish tradition than a statement like that would allow. So I'm sort of trying to, if, if it's not clear here, set up a dialectic that is on the one hand, the difference as it's often articulated is far too stark and simplistic. And at the same time, there are real differences. And we need to think about them. And that's part of a larger sort of project of mine, I would say. I don't think interfaith conversation is about people getting together to just be polite to each other. I think it's ultimately about building enough trust to talk about real issues, including where we actually disagree about deep things. Um, and that's really important and hard, but really, really important. I mean, you know what, if I could, you know, at the risk of you know drawing this answer out too long, I'll tell you that I... I've had a couple of contexts recently where I've said to Christian audiences something that I had some trepidation about saying, but I felt like the conversation couldn't really go forward without my saying it, which is, you know, I said, like, look, I'm happy to have a conversation about loving your enemies in Judaism and Christianity, but I do feel the need as a Jew who is a lifelong student of Christianity to say that it is very hard for many Jews to take Christians seriously about this topic, Right. Because Christianity has, for 2,000 years, preached loving enemies, declared Jews its enemies, and then killed us. So when you talk about loving your enemies as the heart of Jesus' teaching, it's really hard. It's just, there's just so much baggage that we all bring to this conversation that that has to be on the table, too. Um, that's hard stuff to talk about. And yet I feel like if we're going to move to a different place in terms of how representatives of traditions and just not even representatives, how just members of different religious traditions talk to each other, we're going to have to talk about the hard stuff. Yeah, I mean, all these traditions are very vast. So Judaism is undoubtedly about love and undoubtedly has this thread of forbearance. But it's also the Lamashanim al Tikva and and Shvochamatcha. There's also there's other voices as well. Is that is that fair to say? Specifically, the the love your enemy uh, thread is what I'm picking up on. There's other. How, how do you how do you balance the the diversity of sort of approaches within religion to any question? I guess, and especially this is one as you know central as this. Well, so you know, it's funny. That's one of the reasons. I, I didn't elaborate on this earlier, but that's one of the one of the things I mean when I say that the title of my book is a provocation, because no tradition is about anything. Traditions that are about something are often about not something too. Let me say that actually in English for a minute. If you say that a tradition is about X, the odds are very strong that you'll be able to find voices who say not X as well. Right. I, I quote in the introduction this wonderful, I just love this term. I might be the only person who finds this term helpful, but I just keep saying it because it, it really helps me think about this. There's a, a Christian philosopher named Delwyn Brown who talks about how traditions are not monoliths, they're multiliths. Um, I just find that term multilith very, very helpful. Yes, you can find sources in the Jewish tradition that talk about hating your enemies. What I do try to do in my book and in my writing in general, I don't know if I'm always successful at it, but is to acknowledge very directly, that there are sources that cut against some of what I'm arguing. Meaning, I, I'm not really a fan of the approach that says, okay, 
let me select some sources I want to center and let me make the other ones, let me make believe they're not there. I'm sort of more interested in, let me figure out what I think belongs at the center and then let me figure out whether and how it's possible to read the other stuff, the countervailing voices in light of that fundamental commitment. So, you know, I try to engage with the question of what do we do with sources that say hate sinners, right? I think that that's important to do. And I try to show how people who have advocated some version of loving your enemies actually try to wrestle with that. And by the way, this goes back to something we talked about a few minutes ago. I, I, I actually ended up sort of shortening this section, but for a while in the discussion of love your enemies, the central figure in the chapter was a man named Rabbi Yecheska Levenstein, who was the Mashkiach Ruchani, the spiritual guide of the Mir Yeshiva. You know, nobody's idea of a liberal reform rabbi from Hamburg, right? Like straight up kind of ultra-Orthodox figure who ends up saying this totally radical thing, which I found sort of shocking, actually, when I when I was reading this, this kind of long essay of his, where he says, you know, there are sources that appear to say, notice that, that appear to say that we have to hate our enemies or that we have to hate sinners. Um, but in fact, you should know that any time the Torah appears to say something, that if we took it literally would lead us to cultivate vice rather than virtue, we have to know that the Torah can does not permit us to read it literally because the Torah would never engage in commanding something that would make us vicious rather than virtuous. Now, there are a lot of questions about this. I have a lot of philosophical misgivings about what he's arguing, but bracket that for a minute. Here's a guy who's hardly like a liberal progressive, who's basically saying, yeah, I have a reading of this tradition. This tradition says we have to love people. Now you're going to say to me, but wait about, wait, wait a minute. What about the sources that say we have to hate people? Okay, I'm going to read those for you. I'm going to read them. Now, we, you and I can talk about whether we find his reading of them persuasive. One of the things that I'm willing to do that in some contexts you can do and in other contexts you can't do, it has to do with kind of your cultural understanding of tradition is I'm also willing to say about some texts, yeah, I can't make that work. I can't make that. I don't know how to, you know, integrate the mandate to wipe out Amalek with a vision of a God who's about forgiveness. I can't do that. I don't pretend to tie the tradition up with a bow and make it all work. I actually think one of the things that it's important to do in inheriting a tradition is to live with its edges and to live with the sources that are hard, that give us no rest. I don't know. I hope that I'm answering your question as opposed to wandering too far. No, yeah. I think there's um there's a distinction within Judaism within other religions between fundamentalism and and non-fundamentalism. I'm reminded of Ramban, which is a like a early important commentator, I think medieval I would say, I could be wrong about that on the on the Bible in in on the chapters of Noah in the ark. A very very memorable Ramban where he says that the Bible tells us that God created the rainbow after the Noah's Ark incident. But he says, but we can also make a rainbow with a prism in a glass. And so like, given that like we're able to like, you know, do this, we have to sort of like adjust our understanding of what the Bible means when he says God created the rainbow, you know what I'm saying? And and so that's like an example of, you know, you have your textual tradition and, and you have other sources of evidence and you sort of have to, you know, say this other evidence requires us to re recontextualize our tradition. Um, it's easy to do in the scientific realm, easier, let's say, not everyone does it, but it's easier. And then in the moral realm, it's trickier, you know? And so how do you think about that? Um, what wins when you have a moral impulse on the one hand and uncomfortable passages on the other? So, you know, that that's obviously, you know, the kind of $64 trillion question, right? What wins and what methodology do you use in deciding what wins? So I think Something that became helpful to me over the years was wondering, why do the sages of the Talmud, in interpreting the idea that we're supposed to be like God or act like God, imitatio dei, walking in God's ways, why do they say, just as God is merciful, so should you be merciful, just as God is full of grace, so should you be full of grace? Why don't they say, just as God gets angry and launches a plague, so should you? And it was only later that I realized there are actually explicitly sources that explicitly forbid that and say, yeah, you're not allowed to imitate God's anger. You're not allowed to imitate God's zealousness. You, there's a specific things you can't emulate, emulate. Now, on one level, I could give you a textual answer to that, which is, yeah, things like 
Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum, Bachanun, right? The Lord, the Lord, righteous and merciful, sort of make the claim that loving is the heart of who God is, and other things are more, as it were, incidental. But even before that, I, I came to realize over time that I think the sages of the Talmud trusted their moral and religious intuitions a lot. I don't think they really believed that they needed sources to tell them that loving was a more worthy thing to attribute to God than hating. I think they thought, wait a minute, that's crazy needed textual support for that. If you want one badly enough, I can give you one. If you want one, I'll give you one. But I don't think you should need one. You know what it reminds me of in a very different register? Um, since you talked about being a student at Yeshivat Haaretzion in your, you know, in your earlier years, there's this story from when I was in Yeshiva about a student, this just tells you my age, a student who goes to Rav Yehuda Amital, one of the two Rashi Yeshiva, and asks him about, what is the halacha about killing a prime minister who you think is in direct violation of Jewish law, who's a rodef, right? And, it's a very practical right. question because it happened. Yeah, but yes, continue. Exactly. <laughs> and according to the story that I was told by some people who were students at the yeshiva in those days, Rav Amital's question was like, wait a minute. You're asking me for a halachic decision. The very fact that you have this question is a sign of complete moral and spiritual impoverishment. I'm not going to answer this question. This question is an obscenity. Yeah. Right. And that's a kind of a little bit. That's what I want to argue. If, if, if you, you, if one can't figure out that love is more worthy of being attributed to God than hate, then we're already in a completely different moral and spiritual universe. And we have to figure out whether and how we can talk to each other. But I don't, I guess I don't find that question so interesting anymore, if that makes sense. It does. And I think there's a way, and I think you've art articulated it. And, and, and I think it can be even, you know, uh, there's a lot to, to think about it, but you can put on sort of firm footing, this, this Jewish tradition um, as, as, as being non- anti-fundamentalist. I think that there's a lot of evidence that the sages of the Talmud were very radical and they were very creative and they were very innovative. Um, and and that's the tradition that we're heir to. That's the tradition that we point to. If by fundamentalism you mean literalism, then I right. think the Jewish tradition has always been anti-fundamentalist and anti-literalist. I mean, go back to that figure, Rabbi Cheska Levenstein, who I was talking about a few minutes ago from the last century, who says... I know that there are verses that say, hate sinners. I am telling you that only a fool thinks that it means hate sinners. It means hate sin. It has to mean that. Why? Because that's the only spiritually decent position. I mean, you yeah. know, that's as anti-fundamental as if we want to use that language as it gets, right? I mean, what do you mean it doesn't mean that? That's what the words say. No, it doesn't. It can't mean that. I refuse to allow the possibility that it means that. That's a pretty radical statement. And, yeah. and again, yeah. what I found so interesting about it is, and this is, would maybe be a, you know, a topic for a different essay one day. This is not coming from someone who sees himself as reforming anything. He's not trying to reform the tradition or fix it, right? Or at least not explicitly and not consciously. And that's really interesting. He thinks he's doing something perfectly traditional. Whether he is or he isn't is almost immaterial. Right. It's that he thinks that's what he's doing. I mean, that's what I think. That's a kind of a funny paradox. Right. Is that sometimes you have Haredim, ultra orthodox thinkers who are able to say more radical things than modern orthodox thinkers, because ultra orthodox thinkers are not worried about being called reform. Right. Now, right. No, one, nobody's going to call you Levenstein reform me in, you know, good Israelis. No one's going to call him that. Whereas someone might call some Ram at, at Yeshiva Haaretzion reform me. Right. So he's more nervous. That's why I find, I mean, that's one of the many reasons I find figures like Levenstein so interesting. He's like, yeah, but here's another totally kind of example out of left field, not connected to your book. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, great Hasidic master, can tell his students, you know, you should experiment with praying in the vernacular. No rabbi who's aware of Reform Judaism 100 years later is going to say, try praying in the vernacular. He's too scared to say that, Right. But there's something very interesting about what traditionalist communities can say that is in some ways more radical than what modernist communities can say. That's like a fascinating topic to play around with. Yeah. And and, and I guess one of the themes here is that there's so many different texts. And, you know, in my own personal path, there's this element of seizing on to certain texts. 
uh, as as sort of inspiration or, or, or models of, of sort of what Jewish thought contains, you know, and an example that just came to mind in the context of our conversation now is um, a text I haven't looked at in a long time, but I remember is like the end of the tractate of Mako Lashes, where there's this beautiful progression in the in the Midrash there about how God gave the Jews 613 commandments. And then the prophet came and he like whittled it down to like 20, you know, and it's like his 20. And then after the next prophet came and he ruled it. And they're just increasingly more ethical and they're increasingly more just like love. And, and just, and, and this, the argument is, is sort of this, like this, this progression, just like getting to the heart of what really it's all about, you know? And that's one voice among many, of course. But I guess there's what, what, what the, the point here is that this, this kind of process of, um, searching for the heart of Torah or searching for, for, for these, these claims about love and using those, I think, as a, uh, a central axis in, in religious life is, is modeled very well by our sages, you know, that we, that we rely on. Yeah. So for whatever it's worth, I would argue that my, you know, pursuit of the heart of the Jewish tradition, you know, the title of my previous book, the heart of Torah, the subtitle of this one, recovering the heart of Jewish life, that that's a very traditional undertaking. Jews have always done that. You know, if you want to sort of help people orient, you have to give them some center around which to think about their spiritual lives, their lives in learning, their lives in, in mitzvah observance. I think there's something actually deeply traditional about that. That's what I meant when I said Rabbi Akiva sets the precedent when he says love your neighbor as yourself is a great principle of Torah. The example that you cite from Tractate Makot is another great example of that there's a kind of unapologetic willingness to distill. Not to say that the rest doesn't matter, but to say that everything else is red in light of this. Of course, there's a famous story of Hillel and the convert on one foot as another great example of this, right? You know, and the wonderful paradox of, you know, this is the whole thing, go and learn. So I'm not saying the rest doesn't matter, but I am saying this is the lens with which I invite you or through which I invite you to see everything else. That's what I think Hillel seems to be saying there. Yeah, you you mentioned this wonderful story with Ravamital. And by the way, Ravamital also wrote a beautiful essay that had a big impact on my thinking in my yeshiva days about uh, the, the the thesis of the essay is that there's morality external to Jewish law, and he just brings a hundred arguments in in that direction. Anyway, so Ravamital is a great paragon of this kind of thinking, and that story you gave um, reminded me of of a sort of an arg argument in the book um, in the context of Peter Singer's utilitarianism where this this question emerges of you know in a burning building do you save your spouse or do you save a random person you know mm -hmm. um and for utilitarians there's there's no preference so to speak I, ideally ideally there should be no preference um and and there's sort of i think the same kind of you offer the same kind of philosophical uh reaction to that where um there's obviously a preference there, right? Am I, am I doing justice to 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 your your thinking or your writing on this claim, or am I completely uh, messing it up? No, I I think you're saying something important. The way that I would articulate this more abstractly, and then we can kind of get to the concrete, is that I think as a rule, Jewish ethics works with the grain of nature rather than against it. Right? The notion that you can simply override the grain of nature is a fantasy, and often leads to morally undesirable positions. I mean, one of the things that I try to argue in this book in a relatively quiet way is that, you know, the, the philosopher Bernard Williams famously argued, look, if you're going to ask me to justify why I save my wife versus someone else, I'm not, I don't find that question interesting. And while I'm sympathetic to that, what I disagree with Williams about is that he's basically saying, at that point, I'm not interested in morality. And I'm interested in arguing, actually, even from a moral perspective, you would save your wife first because that's what it means to be a human being. To be a human being is to have relationships. When you ask human beings to completely strip away any relationships or commitments that they have and then make moral decisions, you say to them, strip away your humanity and then make moral decisions from there. That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, do I understand why people want to do it? Sure, because we know, as I talk about also, family first very often deteriorates into family only. People think, you know, oh, I only owe something to six people in the world. That's hugely problematic. But I don't think that the alternative to that is this bizarre idea that if my child is starving and your child is starving, my child makes no greater claim on me than yours does. That just does not seem to me to be plausible. That There's a rabbinic proverb, um, God does not make demands 
that human nature is unable to tolerate. I find that to be a really helpful um, way of orienting in the question of Jewish ethics. By the way, this is another place where Catholic thinkers have said to me, right, only Lutherans are like utilitarians in this way. Mm. Lutherans consider, oh yeah, love your neighbor, that means love every person in the world equally. No Catholic ever said that because Thomas Aquinas said it's all about the order of loves. Of course you love your child more than someone else's child. So it means to be a person. So I, you know, I think there's actually a lot of a lot of the questions that we've been discussing in some ways come to a head in precisely the issue um, that you're talking about. Um, you know, another way of saying that is if if because I think this might be helpful for some some aspects of where Jews are often kind of like ambivalent about the way their own tradition talks or what they know about the way their tradition talks. For I th I think for Jewish ethics, the road to the universal is always through the particular and never around it. You don't override the particular in the name of the universal, because if you don't, again, if you don't have particular relationships, you won't have any relationships. The challenge is, how do you genuinely go through the particular and end up at a more universal place? That is not an easy question. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I'm not suggesting, oh, the path that I'm arguing for is easy. I don't think it is easy. I think people, as, as you and I know, get stuck all the time in very local commitments and stay there. But we got to find a way to work through what is natural to us rather than pretending that we can override it, which leads to both implausible conclusions and I think undesirable ones. You know, the example is I, I think I quote, I can't remember whether I edited this out honestly now at the end of the book is that in one of the more recent editions of one of his most influential books, the utilitarian philosopher Peter Singer, who is as radical utilitarian as you can get, basically says, you know, if I was in an area of famine and I had one bowl of rice and it was my kid and someone else's kid, I would like to think I would withhold it from my kid. And I just read that and I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's just bizarre. This is mm -hmm. a bizarre argument to me. I don't understand it. I mean, I understand it. I shouldn't say I don't understand it, but it doesn't resonate for me. And it seems to me that it's, it's inviting us to become monsters mm -hmm. or at least to become less than human in our commitments. Yeah. Okay, um, let's let's talk about a scene. Help me understand a scene, if you can, maybe in the Brothers Karamazov. A theme, a scene, a theme in the Brothers Karamazov is a dichotomy, a duality between universal love and and particular love. It's a it's a question that comes up in in different places. When the most clear formulation is sort of like the first third of the book, uh, we meet Father Zosima for the first time, and he's meeting. He's like this uh, important. Uh, religious Christian clergyman and 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 he's like a, a spiritual leader and people come to him with their questions and one of the people comes and they says that you know universal love is so easy to me you know I, I love everyone but but personal love I can't I have, my relationships are terrible I have no good you know mm -hmm. and um, so I guess it gets the way in which love can mean different things and can play out in different ways and love is is an ambiguous word it's a it's a it's a slippery kind of word um, how how do you think about that the sort of different different connotations and applications of of, of the word. Yeah, so for me, it's been very helpful um, to think about love as an umbrella term for a whole array of different emotions and postures, rather than as describing one particular emotion and posture. And that means that I can talk about loving my neighbor, loving the stranger, and loving my daughter, and actually coherently be talking about love in every instance, without necessarily describing each of them as the same posture or the same emotion. And it was helpful to me to realize late in the writing of this book that in contemporary moral philosophy, increasingly people talk in similar ways, basically saying, yeah, it's not helpful to talk about love as a particular emotion. That's just not, there's too many different things that we mean by love. And look, one of the things that I argue in this book for better and for worse, I, by which I mean that it has costs, even though I think it has benefits too, or else I wouldn't you know, engage in it, is that I think there's a whole array of pro-social postures of, of postures we hold towards others that seek their well-being, that from a religious perspective are helpfully bracketed under love, compassion, kindness, generosity of spirit. Um, I mentioned in passing in the book a fairly obscure point, but I think is important, which is that in Babylonian Judeo-Aramaic, or in less pretentious language, the language of the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, right? And in, by the way, in other Semitic, several other Semitic languages as well, there simply is no way to distinguish compassion and love. It's the same word. In Aramaic, 
the root that means love is Reish Chet Mem, Rachama. That's how you say love in Babylonian Aramaic. So when I call God Rachamana, that can mean the merciful one or the loving one. There's no difference between those two words. It's and from the I word womb, the womb, right? Hmm? From the word womb. So that is a debate among Semitic philologists. Now we're really in obscure land. Okay. Yes, there are, if I'm not mistaken, Samson Raphael Hirsch already argues that the word Rachama, Rachamim and the word Rechem come from the same place. There are some Semitic scholars who think that. And then there are others who say, nah, probably not. That's a nice midrash, but it's not where the word comes from. One of the reasons you might have some doubt about it is the propensity in certain biblical texts to describe rachamim as something that is attributed to fathers. Mm. av albanim. If they really thought that rachamim and rechem were the same word, they would probably say kirachem em albanim. But anyway, that's really, now we're in really obscure <laughs> okay, territory. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. I, I mean, I, I, I'm very happy in this place, as you know. Um, um, but but in other words, I, I, so I, I find it helpful to just think of love more expansively. And I'll say, I, I don't know if this is helpful for, for anyone, but I recently had the privilege of giving a talk at a conference of research psychologists. Um, and one of the things that we came to in our discussion was the realization that philosophers and research psychologists, I don't know about practicing, you know, kind of therapists, but philosophers and research psychologists have opposite impulses sometimes around love. Research psychologists often search for a very particular, almost granular experience you can call love. So they'll say, that's not love, that's attachment. That's not love, that's mercy. That's not love, that's forgiveness. Philosophers often do the opposite. They'll say, oh, that's love, that's love, that's also love. Love is a big envelope that holds a lot of different things in it. Perhaps not surprising, I'm very much in the philosopher envelope here. Um, that's kind of the way I think about love. And it is true for some people, a kind of abstract universal love is easier than actually having a friendship or a marriage. And for others, it's like, okay, you know what? If I can love three people, I consider my life a victory. I don't know what you're talking about with all these big abstractions. And, and similar, you know, the, similarly, when the Torah can say, love God and love the stranger, meaning the immigrant who's not part of your community, well, what do you mean? I'm supposed to have the same emotional response to God and a stranger who I, I barely know. What are you talking about? No, so it's about like, is there is there something about all of those things that is similar enough that they can all be called love. It's almost like, if you'll forgive me, another journey into obscurity for a minute. It's not something I talk about in the book. What medieval philosophers mean when they talk about terms as analogical in meaning, right? So I love my wife and I love sushi, right? You can say love coherently in those two sentences, but obviously if you're a sane person, you're not describing love in the same way in those two sentences. There's something about it that's a thread that ties them together. I'm, I'm saying, you know, love of God, love of neighbor, love of stranger, compassion for the vulnerable are more kind of analogically similar than they are literally the same emotion or posture. Wrapping up here, last few questions. Uh, should our clergy be political or apolitical? That's an interesting shift of gears. So here's what I would say about this, which is, I think, a very hard kind of hard line to thread. I don't think we can say that clergy should be apolitical in the sense that the Torah has lots to say about what a good, just society looks like. And sometimes when people say, I don't want my rabbi to talk about politics, they're basically saying, I don't want my rabbi to talk about anything that's important, unsettling, etc. I, on the other hand, don't think rabbi should be political in the sense of saying, and that's why I'm telling you to vote for this candidate and on this issue to vote for version 7C as opposed to 7B. I think that ideally, we have to find a way to draw out the values. And I don't mean that in some cliche or abstract way, but to draw out the real values that underlie biblical and rabbinic texts, and then to challenge people to really think about how those ideas and values could be translated into contemporary idiom. That means being very political without being partisan. Let me, let me actually, this may sound very abstract. So let me very concretize for a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 15, which is the laws of the sabbatical year in Deuteronomy, right? 
for Deuteronomy, the sabbatical year has nothing to do with letting the land rest. It has to do with the remission of all debt. Every seven years, all debts are forgiven. People who have fallen into poverty are essentially given a new beginning. So you can't make a one-to-one -one correspondence between an ancient Near Eastern text to a, and, and a contemporary global economy. But you can and should say, Deuteronomy seems preoccupied with the idea that entrenched poverty is considered religiously abominable. So what do I, as a Jew who takes the Torah seriously, think I have to do in order to help ensure that entrenched poverty does not take over my society? Good people can disagree about that, although, again, they have to be arguing in good faith. So I want to be political in the sense that I want to talk about entrenched poverty is a huge problem. And to the extent that you pretend that it's not there, or to the extent that you don't care about it because it doesn't affect you or your children, you're missing something really fundamental. But I also don't want to say, and therefore vote yes on this particular you know, piece of, of legislation, because I'm not sure that's the role of a rabbi. Mm -hmm. It feels sort of like a maddening kind of process sometimes, because to me, the way I read the Torah and, and, and the way I, I see it is that love of the stranger, because you were once strangers, is one of the most like central pieces and messages of the Torah. Like if you got one message out of the whole Torah, like you were slaves in Egypt to remember the fact that you were once strangers and oppressed and therefore you shouldn't oppress the stranger. And that's, that's not always a message in the Orthodox Jewish world, which uh, has a lot of purchase. But um, and, so, and that part could feel a little maddening. But the but again, it just sort of echoing back what, what you're saying, there's there's a majorly important political valence uh, to, to that sort of reading of Torah uh, in, in the modern world. So well, I mean, look, absolutely. I Again, do I think that the Torah can help us decide exactly how many Syrian refugees to take in in America in a year? Not really. But do I think that the Torah can make it very clear and does that any society which demonizes and dehumanizes immigrants is one that is unworthy of Jewish values? Absolutely. The Torah says that, I think, very, very clearly. And, you know, we can't not say that. I mean, one of the things that I think is a struggle in the American Jewish community, it's true in other communities too, it's certainly not unique to the Jewish community, is we're also unwilling to let our rabbis actually say anything, mm -hmm. right? If God forbid my rabbi gets up and says something about their understanding of the tradition that threatens my own pre-settled political opinions, well then, you know, let's convene a search committee right away. <laughs> That's just not a helpful way to function as a community. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to read uh, two sentences from the book here. Quote, I don't pretend to have an explanation, let alone a justification for why the road to blessing is so often paved with suffering. But I do know that there is a deep truth evident here. Often the deepest blessings emerge from great pain or even desolation. End quote. Let's say I said, I don't, I don't believe that. What, what, how would you, how would you drive that home? How, how can you, uh, how would you draw out that argument or, or, illustrate that or, or make that, you know, something uh, that someone who might not feel that way or is, is sort of, uh, you know, feels feels beat down by life uh, can can maybe hear. Yeah, so I, I should be clear, I don't mean that every experience of desolation leads to blessing. I mean that I think experience teaches us that very often blessing comes in the wake of experiences that can feel desolating. The first time I ever shared this idea in public, a woman whose child had gone through massive difficulties learning to read, I mean, went from school to school, just could not get there, sort of described how moving it was for her to hear a traditional argument that says, oh, the fact that my kid can now read and attends you know, a good college and has a you know, bright future ahead of him, right? I feel that blessing so deeply in light of the absolute loneliness and misery we went through trying to get him to this point. That's what I was really tapping into or trying to. And, you know, that emerged as, you know, you know, from citing it, from my understanding of the story of Hagar in the Bible, who is, you know, God says to this slave woman, go back and suffer more. It is such a bizarre and distressing moment. And yet, for whatever it's worth. And again, that's why I say I'm not trying to justify this because I don't know how to make sense of it. But when God says, in the wake of this suffering that you will endure, a great blessing will come, I do think there is a human truth that's being tapped into there, a distressing truth, a non-universal truth, which makes it even harder, mm 
But I, I think there's something there that's really profound and important. The sages, I think, of the Talmud were up to something similar when they said, you know, any of the great blessings that the Jewish people received, they got through Yisurim, they got through suffering. Somehow, blessings don't come on silver platters. Like they come in the wake of often very difficult journeys and struggles. And they don't always come, which is why I want to avoid any kind of Pollyannishness in religion. They don't always come. Some lives are beaten down and people die, right, having suffered un in unspeakable ways without really feeling a whole lot of blessing on the other end. So I, I really want to avoid naivete here. I'm just sort of suggesting that there are ways in which many of us have had the experience of blessings coming on the heels of experiences that we feel are just unbearable. Yeah. In in the Orthodox Jewish world, I imagine it extends beyond the Orthodox Jewish world. Uh, I, I've heard a lot from people, especially, you know, some of my family and, and friends, community, the sense of because of uh, the, the Jewish world has gone through such a trauma, Israel is, is, is so traumatized, turning towards messianism, turning towards a certain... In that that strain of our tradition of uh, redemption. How, how do you think about that? You know, on the one hand, the impulse towards messianism, that is the belief that despite appearances to the contrary, the world can and must be different, that it can be redeemed. I value and respect that energy a lot. On the other hand, at the same time, so many forms of messianism, when they are turned into concrete programs, become immensely destructive and ironically bring the world farther and farther away from anything redemptive. So I understand why, you know, years after the Shoah, for example, many religious Zionists adopted a kind of hyper messianic vision of what Zionism was about. And I think they have driven Israel into some very deeply problematic places. So again, I want to hold on to the energy under messianism, but be very careful about um, the concrete political projects that so often grow out of it. I mean, I, I have this vague recollection. I hope I'm not misquoting him. I have this vague recollection of, of once hearing Rabbi Yitz Greenberg say, oh, Jews have two tasks in the world. One is to affirm that there will be a Messiah, and two is to affirm that he's not here yet. Hmm. And that second one is as important as the first one, because otherwise you end up in some very strange places. You have, you know, Chabad messianism that looks a lot like Christianity in certain ways, and you have religious Zionist messianism, which becomes, you know, politically hyper-radicalized, indifferent to global political opinion, and, and for that reason and others, quite dangerous. Yeah, as someone who grew up in the messianistic, messianistic Orthodox Zionist world, I 100% agree. Um, I would love to ask you more questions and keep you fair, but I'll keep one last question and then I'll let you go and, and I'm very grateful for your time. But uh, are you afraid of death? H how do you think about that question, end of life? So let me answer that question in a almost caricature of a Jewish answer. I've been thinking a lot lately about how two of the Jewish thinkers who most live inside my head, Rabbis Abraham Joshua Heschel and Joseph Soloveitchik, appear to have antithetical intuitions about this. For Soloveitchik, at least the Soloveitchik of his classic book, Halachic Man, right? Jews want no part of death. Death is aviavot tatum'ah. Death is a source of impurity. Death is something to be resisted. Death is always and everywhere a tragedy. For Heschel, wait a minute, if God gave me my life as a gift, then when I die, I'm returning the gift. Death is a form of coming home. I've always been, like, this goes back to this issue of multi-lith, right? Here are two of the greatest Jewish thinkers of the 20th century. Their intuitions on this are at loggerheads, to say the least, right? They're completely up against one another. I would say, speaking very personally, that as I get older, I become less frightened of death and more aware of its inevitability. Um, but I do have a hard time shaking the Jewish notion that there is an irreducible tragedy to it, that a story and a life, what, what the sages would call an entire world, will one day come to an end. That's a very hard thing to make sense of and to live with. And I, I find myself thinking a lot about 
you know, the, the dream of the prophet that God will be la hamavet la netzach, that God will one day defeat death. You know, since I just mentioned Yitz Greenberg, I'll mention him again. His whole philosophy of Judaism, and even more so as he got older, um, as he's gotten older, is about the notion that Judaism is the triumph of life over death. I, I, I really, that impulse resonates for me, but the picture feels more complicated. It feels to me like on the one hand, it's, it's about a triumph of quality of life, triumph of, you know, non-tragic death, things like that. And the reality that we're all flesh and blood and finite and will one day die. Rabbi Shaihelt, thank you so much. Thank you for your Torah. Thank you for your book. In addition to being a wonderful book of theology and, and, and Jewish Jewish thought, it's a book of uh ethics and 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 philosophical questions around morality. And it's a personal book and uh it covers a lot of of a really wonderful ground. And it's it's a wonderful read also. Um, and thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you grateful. so much. Thank you. It's really All a right. joy.